Welcome to another episode of 22 at the Lips. I am your podcast host, Alexis Hardwick. And if you are new to this journey, or if you just started, or if you've been here since day one, welcome and slash or welcome back. This is the podcast from EMS providers to other EMS providers and healthcare providers. And if you are the average everyday citizen bystander who so happens to see an ambi lamp or walks upon an ER or a clinic, whatever your situation is, thank you for joining us. Normally, I either have on somebody that I already know or somebody that I've met throughout this journey of EMS and all the incredible people out there. Today is no different. Today's guest is not a stranger to the podcast. He's been on before. Um, I'm not going to lie. Matt, anytime we have a trauma patient, I have that little segment from last podcast where you said, yeah, get a blood sugar on every trauma patient. Bro, when I say every time we drop off a trauma patient, no matter the severity, there is a blood sugar. You have challenged me, my guy, and I appreciate you. But uh, (laughs) here. (laughs) <laughs> it'll sneak up on you i'm telling you it'll sneak up on you one time there was one that it was a uh it was a gsw to the head the guy was somehow somehow stable i'll just put it that way um i mean hemodynamically from what we could see on the monitor at least but when i tell you at the end of the report i said also his blood sugar is what was it 130 something the doctor was like you got a blood sugar i said absolutely he's like oh cool thanks i looked at him like you're welcome but uh (laughs) matt taught me right but um matt where so last time we talked you were kind of in your residency in the cusp of it etc etc where are you at now my guy so so i'm in my final year of medical school uh which is an exciting time we got about 91 days left not that anybody's counting (laughs) Um, so we're making it through the very end of the journey and then we'll, uh, be going off into the, to the sunset somewhere, hopefully, uh, somewhere in the Northeast. I'm hopeful for residency programs, but we'll see what happens in a couple weeks. We find out. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a long journey, but it's been a fun one. (laughs) Um, So as a small little segue into what we're going to talk about, it's a topic that is near and dear to my heart because I deal with it. I don't want to say on a daily basis, it's not like diabetes or high blood pressure or anything like that, but it is something that due to how many times I've had an allergic reaction, um, I have made everyone in my life well aware that if I eat a strawberry and slice or something that has touched a strawberry, I will go into anaphylaxis within five minutes. This is a proven fact. So anaphylaxis, near and dear to my heart. Um, And Matt, I kind of want to give your input since whenever we had had our last episode, we talked about trauma patients. We mentioned the blood sugar, but also the importance of asking your patient, what are your allergies? Um, And in that, like in your two cents on that, I also want to ask, what is the validity of asking like, like for me, I ask how severe is the allergic reaction because I we've we've had patients that they're like, oh, I'm allergic to whatever, and I'm I'm just kind of like, how are you allergic to that? So I ask them like, what does it do when you take it? And they're like, oh, I get I get nauseous. I'm like, okay, well, it's uh, it's Lortab, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> um, what what do, what do you feel like is this the importance of I mean, besides the anaphylaxis that could occur, but the importance of asking patients for their allergies. I I mean, I think it's endlessly important. And, you know, I I try to do it actually very early on in a call, um, just because I never know how calls are going to progress. And you might not have family members around or somebody who knows the patient well enough. And if for some reason that patient were to go unresponsive, well, now you don't know at all. Um, So I do think it's something that's very important to get out of the way early. Um, Because we do carry medications on the ambulances that can cause anaphylaxis. There are agencies out there that are carrying antibiotics. Um, There are certainly other medications that we have that also can have anaphylactoid-like reactions or also just cause anaphylaxis. So it is something that we need to be cognitive about because the last thing that you want to have happen is have an already sick patient that you're now giving an intervention to and then have them be anaphylactic to that intervention. And now you've really, really got a sick patient on your hands. 
So it's, it's, it is very important. And I really, really like how you put that of asking your patients, well, how severe is your reaction or what happens when your reaction? It's, it's really underplayed because health literacy in the country isn't that great. So a lot of people have a, what's an actual, just a side effect to the medication, but they think it's an allergic reaction and it's really not. You know, I think that one of the greatest examples in this country of that is if somebody gets put on an antibiotic for some infection and then they get nauseous. That's like one of the most common side effects of antibiotics out there. And it'll get chalked up to being an allergy and then they'll no longer be able to take that class of antibiotics again because they're now classified as being allergic. Um, but it's really, really important to know that, well, that's actually just a side effect. It's not an anaphylactic reaction. It's not an allergic reaction. Um, so I really, really think it's important for individuals to kind of dig just a little bit deeper into, okay, you're saying you're allergic to this medication. What happens when you take this medication? And, you know, if it's a stable call and, you know, you're not doing a lot of work and you're just, you know, run of the mill call, if it's not a medication you, you carry, I would still dig into it. Certainly if it's one you carry, definitely dig into it. But if you can get that information before you come into the hospital and say, hey, this person has an allergy to penicillin. Last time they took it, they got a rash, and that's what their allergy is. It's it's just helpful all around information. Right. Um, had a patient one time who we were actually treating for an allergic reaction, and I mean, it it got to the point that like, whenever we got there, she was wheezy. So I'm like, all right, Epi from the get go, and I, nobody's allergic to Epi. Whoever's the no, you can't be allergic to Epi. So I was drawing up the Benadryl, and I was like, hey, Ma, like, what you allergic to? She's like, I'm allergic to Benadryl. And I stopped. I was like, what happens if you take the Benadryl? She's like, I get nauseous. So I was like, would you rather still be itchy or nauseous? She's like, please just make me nauseous. I was like, I'm okay. cool. <laughs> like, you already got that But um, yeah, just the severity of it. Um, so for our people who don't know what anaphylaxis is, and I would say like the categories of an allergic reaction, Matt, I'm gonna let you go into detail more because you know a lot more than me. But the way I try to kind of explain it to either patients or people that that I'm around and I say, like, I'm anaphylactically allergic to strawberries. And they're like, what does that mean? So you have your, yeah, I mean, you have like categories of an allergic reaction, such as like nauseous or dizziness or this, that, and the other. But then you have your anaphylaxis. Um, and that's when you have two or more organ systems that are basically battling out it is an inflammation it's the white blood cells that are literally attacking your immune system your body's attacking itself which turns into inflammation which turns into vasodilation so your your blood vessels are expanding they're dilating they're getting bigger which causes in some cases and i just want to say not all Anaphylaxis is hypotension. I don't get hypotensive, but anyways, um, you're hypotension, or in some cases, it's literally the patient's just nauseous and hypotensive, or just nauseous, or et cetera, et cetera. And then eventually, if it progresses, can lead to, and in some cases, um, hives, uh, the the swelling of the throat, closing of the throat. That's, and I feel like in in our case, in EMS, your biggest two things that you want to look for um, from the back, from hearing your patients having an allergic reaction, what is the blood pressure and what does the throat look like? Those are your two biggest things because in your elements of ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation, you encompass those two things in that. But um, I'm not good with words. So Matt, if you want to bring out the big guns and explain what is anaphylaxis, what type of shock it is, because it is a type of shock. It is a very sick, sick, sick patient. The floor is yours, my guy. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you hit the nail right on the head with a lot of what you were saying. And, you know, to just kind of set the basis for people, you know, allergies and allergic reactions really occur on a spectrum of severity where you can go all the way down to a more benign allergy, like you said, where someone maybe gets nauseous, maybe they get a little bit of a rash, a little bit of itching in their skin, maybe they take an antihistamine and it's okay, to kind of like seasonal allergies where they get more of a runny nose, a little congestion. And if anybody who struggles with those, that can be quite annoying. And then we can uh, progress all the way up to anaphylaxis, which is the other end of the spectrum, which this is the, the severe life-threatening reaction 
Um, and this is what EMS was designed for, in my opinion, because these are the patients that we can truly, truly impact in the field. And it's, and it's one of the ones where we do an intervention and we see it happen in real time, how the patient can improve. It's uh, similar to the hypoglycemic patient that we give dextrose to. You know, we can see the real time improvement in these patients and we can make the impact in the field with them. And you said the definition perfectly. Anaphylaxis is this two body systems after an exposure to an allergen. And an allergens can be a host of different things. Most of them are proteins and they can be found in antibiotics. They can be found in food. They can be found in venoms from like bee stings, snake bites, so on and so forth. Um, pollen, mold, really is a huge, diverse array of proteins that can cause anaphylaxis in a person. In, in true medical definition form, this is a hypersensitivity to that protein. So this protein gets into your system, and your body and your immune system is very, very sensitive to it. And what happens is it causes this big chain reaction to occur between mast cells and basocells, which are immune cells, like you said, white blood cells that go out and they cause massive vasodilation. And that results in swelling, edema, and cardiovascular collapse. And it's at that point that you reach anaphylaxis. And if it's not reversed, recognized, and treated quickly, it can be fatal. And recently, it made somewhat of a headline news maybe two months ago of a very tragic case that occurred in the Northeast of a case of anaphylaxis. Um, so it is something to be uh, cognizant of. People do die from this. Um, and it's often something that can be reversed. But if we don't think about it early on, sometimes we can be too late. And I think that's what the scary part of anaphylaxis is. I think anybody who's in EMS knows how to treat anaphylaxis and can treat it aggressively. But I think the hard part is recognizing it and recognizing it early enough. And so if we're talking about the type of shock that it is, so this is, this is classified as a distributive shock, meaning that the pump is working okay for the most part. It's the pipes that are the issue in this case. So all of your arteries, veins, and arterioles, venules, your vasculature system gets dilated by the response from the immune system. And this is similar in a sense to what happens in severe septic shock, where that's also a form of distributive shock. But in that case, it's a result of an infection. In this case, it's the allergen that's doing that. But both are mediated by your white blood cells, causing all of your vessels to dilate. And when that happens, you drop your blood pressure very, very quickly. And all of that fluid can then leak out of your vessels. And then you get this edema, you get bronchospasms, you get swelling around your airway, you're hypotensive, and it's just not a great scenario. Um, as far as like what I would consider when looking at uh, the recognition of anaphylaxis, it has to happen early. We know that, right? These are patients that can be incredibly sick. Um, I'm certain in your time, you've probably had an experience on maybe your ambulance with an anaphylactic patient. It was quick, was it not? Oops, I think you might be muted. LOL. Um, there, sorry. Yeah, our a lot of the anaphylaxis today is like me speaking from first person perspective, but our patient that we did have, she called as soon as she was like, I started getting itchy. I didn't know what else to do. It took us seven minutes to get there and she's already wheezing. Um, another part of that also though, is like, um, I mean, number one, like an allergist told me, sometimes you can just become allergic to something out of nowhere, which is terrifying. Uh, new fear unlocked. Number two is um, when you when you develop that allergy to that specific food or medication or scent or oil whatever it is uh animal um every time you encounter that specific protein like you were talking about or whatever whatever it is the dandruff etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera, um every reaction from then on gets worse because your body's trying harder to fight said thing which is fighting itself um so for her she had had that like an allergic reaction before quote unquote but it was just the hives and so this time in the seven minutes it took for us to get there she started wheezing and that's why like i'm not joking when i tell people and people with like 
I don't want to, I feel bad comparing it to a peanut allergy because I feel like those are worse and peanuts are in everything. Mine's just strawberries. But like, it, it really gets to the point that um, people with peanut allergies, if they smell, some people, if they smell a peanut, they'll start breaking out into a reaction. Mine is if somebody, and it's happened before, if somebody is, I don't know, cutting up, this is what happened the last one I had, knock on wood. Um, they were cutting up some watermelon, cut up a strawberry, and the tongs were in the same place. So when I picked just the watermelon from across the entire fruit selection, they got interacted with the strawberries. And when I started eating that salad, maybe 10 minutes later is whenever it started up. So it's, people have asked me like, if you smell a strawberry, will you, I don't want to try it out. I don't know. And I don't want to find out me, myself and die. Um, so yeah, it's it's the severity, it's the amount of times that they've had this situation happen. Um, in the field, our treatment, what we're taught from day one is, and always follow your local state medical director protocols, but your priority number one is going to be if it is, maybe this is just me, if it's beyond just a rash, just a skin reaction, but there is evidence of they're feeling dizzy. They're feeling, I would even say short of breath. They're feeling X, Y, Z, whatever other symptom. You need to get epi, one-to-one, I am, from the get-go. Whatever your dose is, 0.3. I know an agency that's 0.5, aggressive, but, you know, do you, boo? Not my license on the line. Um, and then I've, I've heard arguments of like, oh, well, what if they're old? Okay, would you rather them be old and have an airway and have further heart issues down the road or old and dead? That's brutal, but just being honest, um, if it is to that severity, um, it's going to be that. I know Benadryl is kind of, it, it's not becoming controversial, but it's more of just like a, yeah, we'll deal with that later. Let's make sure they have an airway, which I respect. Um, our protocol and what I stand behind and what a doctor told me saved my life one time is early onset solumedrol. It's not as important as epi, but with your steroids and all the other mechanisms along the along the line, getting that on board. Oh, also, I'm dumb. Um, with your epi one to one, I am. Um, and when I say this, I don't want, I don't want people to get it wrong. You don't want to cause vasoconstriction, just like you don't want to overoxygenate your stroke patients. You don't want to overoxygenate anybody. I wholeheartedly stand behind the idea that even though if your patient is in anaphylaxis and they say they can't breathe, but their O2 sats are 96, 97, this is just me and I will do it till the day I die and slash or there's an article that says otherwise, a little bit of O2 doesn't hurt because on top of everything that's going on, your, your epi that you injected, that's going to increase the heart rate. It's going to, there's just a lot going on. And then if your patient knows they have an anaphylactic reaction to said thing, they're getting anxious so a little bit of o2 if you can just knock out that one symptom they're having cool because on the other flip side even though you've given the epi you have a line you've given benadryl solumedrol you got them on o2 you got them on the monitor you check their blood sugar that epi doesn't last forever and especially if it is a severe enough reaction the epi's not gonna do a whole lot so if you're not top of everything hauling it to the er asap i hope you either have protocols for intubations and slash or if you are really and i don't want to be mean saying this but also this is a one of those like like you said what ems is made for this is one of those calls that you have to start think you have to start thinking 20 steps ahead and go ahead and like visualize where your et tube is where your if you do needle cripes or surgical cripes, whatever your protocol is, and no, this won't be for every patient in anaphylaxis ever. Like sometimes they are treated. I had a patient who was sore up and down. They had an allergic reaction. She coughed. Her lung sounds were clear. I gave her Benadryl. She was fine, whatever. So it's not every patient, but when you see it, you will never forget it. And if you are not on the ball from the moment you come in contact with that patient, you are going to be in a world of trouble.
Yeah. And they will yeah, get away from it quickly. Oh, one, 100%. Yeah. And the last thing you want to do is be trying to play catch up with somebody who who's going into anaphylaxis. Um, and, you know, kind of when I'm thinking in my head of when I'm dealing with a patient who I'm considering this on is, again, that early recognition is key, I think. And then that's probably the biggest thing that I want people to take away from this podcast is that early recognition and realizing that anaphylaxis is a systemic reaction. It's not isolated to one body system. And, you know, I think a lot of people are taught and have this, you know, this visual in their head of what an anaphylaxis reaction is. They're going to be somebody who's going to be pale. They're going to have these uticaria like hives, these raised pin itchiness all over their, uh, their skin. Their lungs are going to be wheezy. They're going to have huge tongues and all this laryngeal edema going on. That's not always the case. Okay. Yeah. Oftentimes, a large portion of anaphylactic reactions it can actually start with just GI symptoms. So things like nausea, vomiting, um, coupled with another body system, say, you know, hives, for example, is something that you really need to be considering early on that this could progress to a severe allergic reaction. And at that point, I would probably pull the pin on doing epi on that patient. I've got two body systems involved after an exposure to a known allergen. That's anaphylaxis until I am confident that it is not. And I really, really urge people to be aggressive with these patients within their protocols. And Hand step. Also, yeah, and don't don't rely on skin findings either. There's a good percentage. I forget the number off the top of my head, but there is a good percentage of anaphylactic patients don't present with any skin symptoms at all. So if you're relying on those uh, uticaria or hives as a rule out method of anaphylaxis, you're going to be doing your patient an injustice. Um, do, just because they don't have skin findings, they could still very much be in anaphylaxis. So really get a good history. If they've been exposed to an allergen, take it seriously. Um, these are patients that need to be watched carefully. Um, and then so now we've recognized it. So now we need to move into, okay, we've recognized it. I think this patient is going into anaphylaxis. What are we doing about it? And you nailed it on the head. I am epinephrine. I am epinephrine. I am epinephrine should be the way to go. That is the drug of choice. That is what these patients are going to need. All of the other medications are secondary to the epinephrine. You know, that is what our goal needs to be. Um, certainly, in most places are working two-person crews. Um, so take advantage of your partner. Have them start managing airway. It can be BLS airway up front. Simple oxygenation, have them start doing vitals. If you already have this person diagnosed with, with anaphylaxis, epinephrine is what we need. Uh, my dose is the 0 0.3 milligrams IM. Again, I've yeah. certainly known of agencies where it's 0 0.5. Um, we just got to give the epinephrine whichever way you want. Um, some people, there's been a debate. I don't know of any good literature out there on it of whether or not if the deltoid is the appropriate location for it or if the thigh is going to be the appropriate location for it. I don't know of any studies that compare the outcomes of this. Put it into a muscle and let the, the epinephrine diffuse in. Um, and then from there, then we can start doing all of our secondary stuff. So, and I think a, a big thing that's often missed is uh, decontamination. These patients were exposed to an allergen. Let's make sure that allergen is not still there. Uh, so, <laughs> still eating the peanut butter sandwich. Right. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> we got to make sure that they're not still being exposed. Um, this is crucial for things like bee stings, um, trying to make sure that the stinger is still not in them. If you can find where they were stung, if it wasn't a, a food-based allergy, it, it sounds a little gross, but trying to make sure that none of that food is still left in their mouth. Um, this, this, this can really play a, a big impact on them is just trying to decon them from that allergen. And I think it's often kind of neglected a little bit. Um, but I do think it's an important thing to consider is, uh, is deconning the patient from the allergen as best you can. Um, certainly ABCs, those are forefront as well, but those are kind of my three big steps when I first walk into somebody who I think is having anaphylaxis is, is epi decontamination. ABCs. And then from there, I go forward with the, the rest of the treatment modalities that you mentioned earlier. Um, between the steroids, you know, there was some recent literature that came out that looked at things like um, Decadron, Salumedrol, um, and what their role was with the idea being that 
we give the steroids up front, not so much because it's going to help in the initial reaction, um, just simply because their mechanism takes a little while to kick in. But the idea being, if we give steroids, then we present uh, help to decrease the likelihood of recurrence of anaphylaxis later on once the epi wears off. Yes. Some of that's been questioned recently. There was a couple studies that came out that said, eh, maybe steroids aren't uh, as effective in that regards as we once thought. I'm of the camp that currently I don't think the evidence is enough there to say to not give steroids. Um, Thank you. So I would still give them. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I don't see it as necessarily being a harmful intervention yet. I just don't think the data is there to to say that, nope, this is causing harm. And I don't think the data is there necessarily to say, yes, it's going to help gr uh, greatly. But I do think they're still worthwhile to give. So I, I would still give the steroid if it's within protocols. Um, and then with oxygen therapy, I like it. I, I, I think if you have somebody who's going into to anaphylaxis, these are patients that deserve oxygen. And I agree with you, you know, if I'm clinically looking at somebody and they're breathing 30 times a minute, and I think they're having a severe allergic reaction, I'm still going to give them oxygen, no matter what that pulse ox says. Um, these pulse ox takes a little bit of time to change, first and foremost, that's not going to be an instantaneous, <laughs> you know, they could, they were healthy before, and now they're having a severe allergic reaction, there might not be enough time for that pulse ox to change yet. Um, and also, when you're in anaphylaxis, you're in a shock-like state, you're going to have a little bit higher of a, of a metabolic demand than normal. You know, if a normal healthy adult is about five to eight liters a minute of oxygen consumption, an anaphylactic patient, it could be more than that. So I don't think giving them a little bit of supplemental oxygen is, is a bad move at all. I do it myself. Um, am I advocating for people to take out an NRB and crank it up to 25 liters per minute? No. But I think you know, justified oxygen therapy isn't going to hurt this patient in any way, shape, or form, and it could be beneficial. Um, certainly, once the reaction gets tamed down, we can always DC the oxygen. We don't need to leave these patients on it forever, but I think in the acute phase, I, I completely agree with you that I think that that's a very wise and smart move to do. Um, other interventions, you know, the, there's antihistamines, which may have a role um, I don't know of anybody that carries uh, H2 antihistamines like famotidine or Pepsid. Um, that's given in the hospital. Again, there's some <laughs> right. of whether if, it, if there's some use to it, um, but it is given in the hospital. If it's available for protocol use, fine. Um, but I think the, the key takeaway that I want people to understand is, is epinephrine is the key player here. And I have certainly seen people get distracted by the litany of other medications that are in the protocols from fluids to oxygen to antihistamines and steroids, and they neglect the epinephrine. Epinephrine is the way to go to start. And that's what I really hope people would take away from this little spiel that I just give or gave. 100%. Um, especially like when you look at grand scheme, um, uh, and national registry scenarios and whatnot. When you're going through school, you have these scenarios that you have a patient that is sitting there. Like you said, it's not always scratching and red and hives and all that stuff. Sometimes it is the pale, cool, clammy skin. And so you have that patient and then you're able to sit and talk to them and get your vital signs and then get in the real world. We don't want to go rogue. We don't want to go wild, wild west, just slinging drugs at everybody with no remorse and no control. But when you recognize that it is the multiple body systems, which multiple means two or more, and it's not a stomach ache, it's not a stomach bug, it is an anaphylactic reaction. If you can get vital signs full, but if not, What's the point of getting vital signs if you're not immediately treating what needs to be treated in that moment? Granted, you need to get your vital signs before you give drugs, but this could just be me. In the case of anaphylaxis, giving your epi one-to-one -one before getting vital signs is not going to make or break your patient. Even as you're talking to the patient and getting either you're drawing up the epi or something like that, you can get a pulse rate. Good. There's your vital signs. Call it a day. Anyways, real world scenarios, um, kind of on a turn of, like you said, with decontamination and steroids and whatnot, 
sometimes you have your patients that they're in anaphylaxis and you get the call notes of they ate this 10 minutes ago, this happened, blah, blah. You get there and they look completely fine because they gave themselves an EpiPen. I think a big debate that needs to be talked about is do we still transport these patients or not? My stance, either you need to transport or you need to get an understanding from the get-go of we, you know, you don't have to go with us, but we'll follow you to the hospital because in your severe anaphylactic reactions, um, and I'm I'm grouping myself in on this, I can give myself my epi and be good for maybe 10 minutes. And then you have what's called the refractory episode where because this reaction is so strong and X, Y, Z, blah, 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 it comes back. And like I t- I'd said earlier, like the epi doesn't always last for forever and ever. It's not a, you know, you give yourself the EpiPen, congrats, you're good. Enjoy the rest of your life. Like it says it on the EpiPen. If you administer this, you need to be seen by the ER because it can either, it can come back in 10 minutes. It can come back in an hour. It can come back. I mean, you're observed in the hospital, in the ER for at least four hours. That's like the minimum. Just because if it comes back, it's, it's going to come back with the strongness. Um, I had one that was managed for, I had an alert, the initial reaction. It was getting treated up on maybe 30 minutes later, had another refractory episode, got it treated up on in the ER. No big deal. Made it up. They kept me overnight, made it up to the ICU. And it was the nurse introduced himself, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, Hey, so where are we at right now? One to 10. I'm like, you know, I'm at a four. I'm just, I'm so tired. I've gotten a ton of Benadryl. This is exhausting. Like, I, yeah, I'm gonna just hit the hay. He's like, all right, cool. If you get up to a seven, he's like, or at least a six, please call me. We'll go ahead and start doing the thing. I was like, hopefully not. I think we'll be good. Maybe five minutes later, I hit the button and I wasn't able to talk. And he comes back and he's like, you said, you said you would call back if it's a seven. I was like, we're at an eight, my guy. But, uh, <laughs> the 80 year old smoker voice. But, um, yeah, it's that's what I feel like is not taught in paramedic school or EMT school or anything is that the reality of some of these calls is that you will get called and it's already treated because maybe a family member called, maybe a bystander called, whatever. It's not a, I, I, I don't know how you would look at it, Matt. I look at it as it's not like a, um, I, was nauseous and then I threw up and now I feel better. It's this is an actual life threatening emergency that occurred. It got treated and it's okay in this moment. And I would even go a step further to kind of like I said, either follow that person as they are transported to the ER. And if your system has a problem with that, they can have a serious heart to heart talk with me, give them my number or my email and we can resolve that. Um, or you can call whoever is in charge of you in the street and say, hey, we're going to wait a while so this patient doesn't croak by the time we leave this house um, if we leave and nobody's available for the next 20 minutes and then they croak. So, um, well, don't mind the soapbox, but um, these are not patients that you just, like you're diabetic, so you can just treat the blood sugar, fix them a PB&J, call it a day, make sure they're not allergic to candle, but fix them a PB&J and call it a day. And, you know, like, oh, have somebody watch you for the rest of the night. No, like if you are not monitored for a couple of hours and this happens again, it's going to be very detrimental to your health, not to include like, I mean, you can also tell your patients just because you go to the ER, it's not always guaranteed they're going. And this is what, when I have my reactions, the last one I had was very minor, but I started crying and my boyfriend had to look at me. It was like, just because you're having this doesn't mean you're going to get intubated. Like it's okay. Some people, it is that severe. Not everybody. Great. Not everybody, but just also having that reassurance of like, it's not going to take that long. It's better to be safe than sorry. It's, it's those kind of patients. Um, sometimes it does require an ICU stay. Sometimes it requires being on a ventilator, but it's better to go through all of that and be alive end of the day than to sit at home because you don't want to go and die so (laughs) it's it's morbid but it's true 
No, no, and I, I think you're you're entirely right there, and I think we share a very similar mindset on this. Is you know, first, I would say that like anaphylaxis, you know, it's it's quick in its disease process, but it's not necessarily quick in its onset. Um, meaning that somebody can be exposed to an allergen, and it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to develop symptoms of anaphylaxis within minutes um, or even seconds. You know, it can take a little bit. You know, seventy-ish percent of of these reactions do occur within the first 20 minutes of the exposure, um, 90% within the first 40 minutes, that still leaves one in 10 that are in excess of 40 minutes and longer before they start to develop these symptoms. And the other thing that I would uh, consider in the scenarios that you brought up is you're saying that you have somebody who has been told by their doctor that they need this EpiPen. Okay. They, they, they don't just hand out EpiPens to everybody. Um, they're, a, expensive. Because they're expensive, right? They're, unfortunately, that's the way they are. Um, <laughs> and that's a, a whole different soapbox for another re, for another day, <laughs> um, but they're expensive and it's epinephrine. It's not necessarily a benign medication when it's not needed. So these people are given epinephrine um, for a reason. And then they decided that they needed it at that point in time. So I, I would take those patients very seriously, and I would very much encourage them to go to the ER. Um, certainly, you know, or an oriented adults are allowed to, to make their own decisions, um, but they need to be counseled on the severity of those decisions. Um, so like you nailed it exactly. These patients, this reaction can reoccur. And I guess the things that run in my head when I'm looking at that scenario is, a, well, they just use their EpiPen. Does that mean they have access to another one? Or do they just use their only rescue med that they have? Because if they have a repeat reaction, okay, well, now they also don't have their rescue med, and now we're really in a bad scenario. Yeah. And then the other thing that I would consider is how confident am I that they use that EpiPen correctly and actually held it down to their skin for the full 10 seconds to make sure they got the full dose? of the epinephrine that's used to treat the reaction. Um, these are scary scenarios. And oftentimes, again, these people aren't trained healthcare professionals like we are. So I wouldn't be overtly shocked if they didn't get the, all of the medicine that they were supposed to get. And maybe they got enough to maybe stay off you know, the reaction. Maybe they're feeling a little bit better, but they might not have gotten the full 0 0.3 milligrams that's in the adult pen. Um, and so I think that's a very valid consideration to have in these patients, and it's something that they should be counseled on. Um, these patients should go to the hospital. They should absolutely be, um, if the resources are available, they should be monitored by the highest level of care available on the ambulance. Um, these are not patients that I would leave um, to a BLS provider unless that's, if you're on a BLS ambulance, then so be it. We go to the hospital anyways, and we manage up to our appropriate level of care. EMTs can do great things for anaphylaxis. By no means am I saying they can't. Um, but if available, these patients should be being supervised by the highest level of care available to them. Um, and for me, that means I'm putting them on the heart monitor. I'm doing a full physical assessment on them. I'm decounting them as I see fit. And I'm putting them on nasal capnography because I like to watch how that lung tissue is going. Sometimes, often, that, that lung capnography, it will change into a bronchospastic pattern before people will mm -hmm. feel short breath, and you can watch it happen in real time. And I'll tell you, if I have somebody who has a ex known exposure to the allergen, they've already given themselves an EpiPen, and I can see them start to change on my monitor before they'll change cl clinically, I'm already considering going down the route of a redose. So it's just something that I think a lot of people need to consider, that these patients need to be reassessed constantly. Because like you said, that reaction can occur and it will occur quickly. And it's not something you want to be behind the eight ball on. Especially um, something that um, I had a, had a reaction in the middle of paramedic school class one day. And uh, I, I told my instructor, cause we were like in the heat of, I forgot what subject and like, I had to get trued up on and she was like, we're calling an ambulance and you're going to go. And I was like, no, ma'am, I'm not going to go. Actually. She was like, Alexis, don't be stupid. I'm like, I'm not being stupid. Like I can't miss today. She's like, you can miss it. If you're dead. She said, also you ate the thing. She said, did you throw up? I was like, no. She's like, cool. So it's still in your body. She said, you're being stupid right now. What would you tell your patient? And I was being a little butthole because I'm like, if my patient didn't want to go, I don't make them. So, uh, <laughs> which is not true. I would 
I fuss at some patients that we end up getting refusals on because I'm like, if you were my dad, I'd make you go anyways. Um, but it is something to consider that if it is something that they ate, it didn't just magically disappear because they got the epi. It is still being digested. It is still being processed. And depending on how much they ate could also be a determining factor of, okay, cool. It's gone. Like you used your EpiPen, you took some Benadryl, whatever. It's gone. But congratulations, your food is still floating around in your body. Like, mm. Um, yeah, definitely like, like I tell, uh, new hires and stuff, like people brand new into, into EMS. Um, if they happen to be on our ambulance, like when we're showing them around, showing them how to do stuff, I always tell them nothing. I don't want to be crass with this. You don't have to be gentle with anything except the patient. Now don't break stuff, but with that mindset. Every call you have to take, not in a delicate sense, but um, still treating with kindness and in a timely fashion, X, Y, Z, et cetera, et cetera. But next to when the heart stops or when the lungs stop, I th this is just me because it's near and dear to my heart, something that is very, very close to me. But I feel like anaphylaxis is also one of those calls that you got to get rough from the get-go like not with your patient you're not beating your patient up but it's not time to hi how are you doing today what's going on it's hey how long has this been going on did you eat anything wear anything new you know anything new all right cool the epi like that that's just that might just be me um depending on your experience and life scenarios and whatnot but that's just that's how i look at it because like you had said matt like if you are behind, you are way behind. You are still at the patient's house and we are at the ER. Congratulations. Like you were behind. Um, that's just how I look at it. I don't, I don't know. I don't know a lot. Yeah, no, totally. No, I, I agree completely. You know, these, these are patients that can decompensate quickly and we need to take uh, very seriously. And if for some reason they don't want to go, they need to be fully informed of what the risks are uh, of not going. And for me, I don't mince words with it. Um, I, I tell people that they could die from this and they need to understand that it's not me trying to scare people. I never try to scare people into going to the hospital, um, but they do need to be fully aware of the consequences of not going um, and they need to know how to call us back if they decide that they do want to go. So, you know, just protect yourself and do what's best for your patient. Um, you know, the, these are patients that, okay, they had an uh, allergic reaction. They gave themselves an EpiPen. They're fine. They don't need me, right? They already fixed the problem. Well, that's not true. They need to be reassessed. They need this time to make sure that it doesn't come back um, because that's that's the storyline beginning in tragedy right there um, is, is somebody who did a refusal on somebody who was having anaphylaxis. Oof. Oof. I don't look good in orange and I don't look good. Um working at a fast food joint so that's just how i look at it i mean I, I hate nothing against i've worked in fast food like nothing against that but i'm burnt out but i love my job me um no and at the core of it these are people's lives in our hands we have the training for a reason we have this knowledge for a reason so when we see xyz we understand what it is and how to treat it and that's i mean that's the core of our job absolutely saving lives whatever chasing the grim reaper but um matt that's that's all i have um you have anything else you want to add or anything like that yeah i guess uh just as kind of like a, a, a wrap up here um you know anaphylaxis is the systemic issue right it's not one body system it's more than one um it's something that happens after an allergen exposure and keep it up broadly on your differential for any undifferentiated shock patient you know, if you're showing up and you're not sure what's going on and this patient is hypotensive, they're not looking great, you know, consider anaphylaxis as something that needs to be ruled out for you. Um, be aggressive in treating it. Epinephrine should be your your mode of choice in the initial steps of this. Airway management is key. Um, be prepared, that just as you said, if you need to take the airway, be prepared to intubate. Be prepared to do that surgical airway if you need to do it. Um, planning is going to be your friend on this scenario. Pre-game it out with your partner while you're going to the scene. Develop a plan of action of what you want them to do and what you're going to do. Seconds can matter in this call. 
Um, so just keep it in mind as you're going in. Um, and as always, you know, follow local protocols, ask questions, get good follow up on your patients and see how they made out. Oftentimes, these patients will be discharged from the emergency department back to home feeling great, like nothing ever happened. Um, and I think this is one of the true ones that I think EMS can make a great difference in someone's life on. Someone who has had their life saved um, by a paramedic on an ambulance um, multiple times. It is true. It is very true. It is definitely something that we can treat in that moment and we can literally make the difference between life and death. Um, so yeah, also taking this time to plug in. If you don't remember the last time you got an allergy test, highly recommend going in and getting tested getting in that, that allergy test, maybe some blood work. But if nothing shows up, don't worry. Me too. Ha ha. You're still allergic. It's okay. So, uh, <laughs> Matt, if that's all you got, that's all I got. Um, I know you're on shift, so I'm not trying to keep up too much of your time. But I always appreciate all of your wisdom, all of your advice. Um, dude, I'm so stoked for you, Dr. Jim. But, uh, we're getting there. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be awesome, man. We'll celebrate. But um, appreciate you and all that you do. And if that's all you got, that's all I got. And Absolutely. as I Thank end. So for having me again. I really appreciate it. These are a lot of fun. I'm sure we can do it again in the future sometime. Dude, I, like we talked about off the air, I have the opportunity some days to take naps. You do not. I'm always open, my guy. You just let me know. <laughs> Fair enough. My people will call your people. <laughs> Matt Jim and Associates. But um, as as I end every single episode, so with that. The 22 at the Lips podcast is designed to support, not replace the relationship that exists between a practitioner and his or her medical director. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the host, guest, and not necessarily of Master Medics. The information provided during this podcast is intended for educational and informational purposes only. It is not a substitute for your approved protocols.